Are you ready to bring your Bibles? I want to encourage y'all to bring your Bibles cause, because I, I want to, some of the things that, uh, that we cover I think are important, that you see it in the Word of God, that you just don't take somebody's word for it, and, but you find in the Word of God and let God speak to you through His Word on these subjects. But today I want to talk to you, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But here's what I want you to know and what I want to tell you this morning. I'm not going to be in a hurry on this because I want to take our time and I want, because I want you to, and I'm, I'm growing even as I'm studying. I'm learning new things, new aspects about God and his Spirit. So I want you to be able to fight. We're going to take our time. We're going to read it in the Word. We're going to look it up. We're going to talk about it. Um, but I think it's, it's now is the time because of what God is calling this church to, to be a witness. Now, last week, I'm going to start testing you because I want you to begin to remember these words. Can anybody remember where the word for 2019 is in the Bible? What was it? Heard somebody say? There you go. Acts 1 8. Turn in your Bible and let's read it. And Mark. Now listen, this is the word of the Lord to us. Acts 1, verse 8. The Bible says, But you shall be shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why? And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit immerses you covers you it says in another place that you will be endued that means like clothed with the holy spirit i told uh i go ahead and put that up there um uh, because there's two places in the bible that talk about immersion i mean two two different th place things that it's talking about when it talks about immersion one is water baptism where you are immersed, you are totally laid down. And it represents laying your old life down, dying to your flesh, dying to your old life, and being resurrected anew and afresh as a new creation in the Lord Jesus when you're raised back up. That is water baptism. And we believe that it is to be, that you are to be immersed, not sprinkled. You are to be immersed engulfed covered by the water the second thing that immersion is talked about is the holy spirit it's the bab baptism of the holy spirit it's where you go under the holy spirit and it's flow it comes down from above over you and on you i thought about a waterfalls and that's what i had liz put up there if you think about this this huge waterfalls being like the Holy Spirit, and you just get right up under that and allow that to begin to flow and to totally engulf you and totally be immersed in the Holy Spirit of God. That's sort of like what baptism's like. The only and the, the thing that's a little bit different with it, as God begins to lead you and you begin to walk, that waterfall just goes with you. You're constantly being, being engulfed and immersed to where you're, you're, you're drinking the water. You're, you're, everything is just flowing over you and in you and through you to the place that you were, you, you were just totally immersed in the Spirit of God. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you stand up under that, and allow it to wash over you, you will receive power. Now, what does that mean? Power for what? Power, the definition of power is 
the ability, the supernatural ability to do something you couldn't do in your own strength or power. That's the biblical definition of it. It's the supernatural ability to do something that you cannot do in your own power or your own strength or your own mind. You will receive supernatural ability to do what I ask you to do that, that from above. It's going to come from above that, that you can't do in your own strength. So you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witness. You're, it gives you the power to be a witness that we couldn't normally do in our own strength. See, we can plan an outreach and go in our own power, go in our own strength, but it will not be as effective as we'll allow the Holy Spirit to empower us in a way that we will be a witness of him in such a supernatural way that we don't even know we're doing it almost. It's something that's coming out of us that, that, that we don't even understand or know or could do in our own ability. We will never be the witness that Christ is calling this church to be in our own power. Apart from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, apart from that waterfalls coming down on us and us willingly placing ourselves up under his flow, we will not have the power to do what he's calling us to do. Jesus is saying when we are baptized or immersed with the Holy Spirit that we receive this supernatural ability to be a witness. It's being a supernatural witness, a witness that we couldn't do or be in our own self or strength. Last week, as I shared a little bit about Smith Wigglesworth's prophetic word that he gave in 1947, um, he said that... Um, there was going to be two distinct, powerful moves of the Holy Spirit. And again, this was in 1947, over the next uh, decades, he said. And he said that uh, one of those was going to be the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to those that would be willing to receive it. The other uh, move of God was going to be that people were going to begin to leave these traditional churches and start new churches. And he didn't say why or anything, but I believe it's so that they could be totally led by the Spirit of God and could come out from under man-made traditions and those kind of things. But anyway, he said during each of these moves that people are going to say, this is the great revival. We've, here it is. When the baptism of the Holy Spirit starts being received, man, that's an exciting time, and we, we assume that that's, man, the great revival. God's moving. But he said neither of these are true, but they're part of it. He said when the baptism of the Holy Spirit has come and been, re been restored and the truth we worship in spirit and in truth when the truth of God's word is brought together with the baptism of the Holy Spirit then the great revival will begin so as I've watched over the last I don't know how many years 20, 30 years at least probably of and it, hap it was happening prior to that, but I wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost, so I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't watch nothing. But as I've watched the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming into churches and to people, uh, you know, it's like we talked about a little bit about last week. We've also seen the abuse. We've seen the lack of the truth uh, being applied. Now I believe that God is bringing that truth to the baptism of the Holy Spirit where it's not just some out there crazy thing trying to draw attention to to people and ministers even what neil was saying to get the minister recognized and how powerful and how great i am and and people fall out every time i lay hands on them and you know we saw the abuse now with the truth of god's work we're bringing some stability because everything's about him it ain't about me, and it's not about us. It's not about the worship team. It's not about me receiving a name and, a, and fame and fortune. It's not to build your name. It's not to build your ministry, and it's not to draw people to our church. It's to empower us to be a witness of Jesus Christ, to build us up, to strengthen us, and empower us, and to assist us in our prayers when we don't even know what to pray. It's to point people to Jesus. 
It's the power to raise up people instead of pushing down people. I mean, how many times have we seen it? I've been a part of it. I couldn't wait for it. You know, I longed, I, I remember the times that I wanted to go up and somebody lay hands on me and me fall out in the Holy Ghost, and I'd fall out before I even got there just if I needed to, just so, just so that I could do it. But, you know, an encounter, you know, as we grow and get excited about the Lord, we've got to remember that Christ is the central place. It's him. It's not about me. It's not about me getting this some awesome thing and this great preacher got to lay hands on me and I got to get a word from, you know, from the preacher. I, you don't really need a word from me. You need a word from God. You need to be touched by the hand of God, not touched by me. Now, I know the Bible makes it clear that we can lay hands, but I think when we do lay hands, that we've got to understand that we're representing Jesus. We're laying his hands on you, not my hands. When we speak a word, the truth of God to you, it's not my word, it's the word of God that's come. You know, I just find it amazing that how we've how we've watched that and how we how you know I've been a part of that and how I've seen it. I'll be honest with you, and I repent before the Lord right now, before the Lord and before you. I've wanted to lay hands on people and see them fall out. Why? Why would you want that? To make me look good, make people think, my gosh. He's way up there, and I'm way down here. He walks in the power. He can just touch you, and you go out on the floor. God, forgive us. Forgive us. You know what I find in the Bible? I have yet to find a place. There, there may be. But I, can't, I can't remember offhand where I've read anything where Jesus laid his hands on the people, and they just fell over. What I see in the Bible is Jesus is causing them to get up. I see the lame man laying, and Jesus says, get up and walk. That's what I see. I see Lazarus in the laying in the grave, and I see Jesus say, Lazarus, get up and come forth. Jesus said in Acts 26, uh, 16, but listen, let, you might want to turn here to this. When I found this yesterday, I about started running. <laughs> That's what that Amber's saying right there. Acts twenty six sixteen because this is this is the word of God this is what Jesus said but man I'm taking this and applying it right now to the ark and for what he's told us Jesus said in Acts twenty six sixteen but rise and stand on your feet get up Quit while, you know, quit trying to draw attention to yourself. Get up, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. Okay, here we go. He has appeared to us for this person purpose. To make you a minister and a witness of both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Man. There's more that we don't know. God's going to show us some things in the next little bit. If we'll get up and be empowered by the Spirit of Almighty God to do what he's called us to do, he's going to continue to reveal revelation, give us truth, and give us understandings of things that we have no eye has seen, no ear has heard. I'm telling you, we live in a great, in a great time right now. This, this church is in a great place. Thank you, Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 14, And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now, I know it's talking a little, you know, that you know, I'm not trying to take it out of context. He's saying that, you know, you don't, you know, there's going to be a resurrection. You're coming up. You know? But I believe at the same time, God is not after getting us down. He's after getting us up. I mean, I, and let me say this. Now, I'm not against, because I'll be honest with you, I've experienced it. I experienced it when I didn't even know what it was. 
And, and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you on this. I, I remember the day that I guess I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but yet I didn't have a prayer language because I didn't understand it and I didn't know what to do, and I'll get that in a minute. But I remember standing in the presence of Almighty God in such a powerful way that I hit my face. And it wasn't that I fell out necessarily. I didn't. I was weak and I was going. But the main thing is I wanted to get on my face before the Lord. I wanted to bow before him as I wept and as I cried in the presence of a mighty God that no longer was for me just way out there, but was right here, right here with me. That overwhelmed me, and it caused me to want to bow before him and to get before him in a prostate way and to cry out for repent. Man, I, I was so convicted of sin, I guess. I think I'd been born again prior to that. I hope I had. But I was so convicted of sin. and Because you can't come in the presence of God like that and not be convicted of sin. I cried out for forgiveness and repentance as I wept at the feet of Almighty God. It wasn't because some speaker. I remember the moment. I didn't know nothing about nothing. But I went to a conference. And I said, God... I want to know if this stuff I've been reading is true or not. Because I didn't want to get misled. I didn't want to go, you know, be deceived by the devil and get into some crazy something that was ridiculous. I said, God, I want to know this weekend if it's right or not. The speaker, I've not, I think I've seen him once since that day, and that was years ago. He didn't know me from Adam. Nobody in that room knew me from Adam. I was there by myself. I sat practically the second row from the back, except I was over here. In the middle of the row, the guy walks out. I've been praying for a week. God, this weekend, I want to know. I want you to show me. I want you to teach me. Be careful what you pray for. He started speaking. You know, they did praise and worship. He started speaking. And he hadn't said hardly much at all. And he said, you, right back there, come up here. And I, went, I looked around thinking, he couldn't be talking to me. He said, no, you, you. And I was going, oh, crap, is it me? And, and then he said, yeah, you. And I went, me? And he said, yeah. And I came up, and I cannot tell you one thing he said. I don't know nothing about nothing. All I know is he laid his hand on me. And, and in a, just a minute, I was in the floor weeping before the Lord. Not, I didn't fall out because I couldn't, because I had no ability. I got in the floor before God, and he just went on about preaching and doing his thing. Well, in a few minutes, I'd try to, I think, I've got to get up and get out of the floor. And, and, and I'd try to get up, and he'd just go back, and he'd say, no, he's not done. And he'd touch me again, and down I'd go. The whole, for two solid days, I stayed in the floor. I mean, you know, at the end of service, we'd go to the room, but come back. And he did it again the next day and would not let me get up. I left that place knowing that there was a power that I'd never experienced, that there was a closeness with God that I'd never had, that, that God wasn't just way out there, that God was right here. I didn't have a prayer language. I didn't know what exactly had even happened to me. But my life was changed forever. I was, from that day forward, I've never been the same person. You would have never, prior to that, you would have never, ever caught me up here, I promise you. But there is a change in your life when you allow the Spirit of God to come upon you in such a powerful way. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not so that you can have power to push people down. It's to give you the power to be a minister. It's the power to lift people up. It's the power to say, stand to your feet. Be encouraged. It'll change your life. In the beginning of each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I found this was interesting, but it clearly states in each of the four Gospels, really pretty much right at the very beginning of the chapters, 
that Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. See, there's so much about the Holy Spirit, but yet we rewrite over it because honestly, the devil loves to keep your eyes blind, <laughs> keep you to where you can't see it. Look with you, turn in your Bible. I'm just going to show, it, show you some of these things. These is John, this is John saying, and let's look at Matthew first. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is John. You might want to mark these in your Bible because I want you to see, I want you to see in the word of God about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see and be able to go back because I'll be honest with you, I had to study. I spent a lot of time prior to that day at the conference I told you about. I probably spent a year seeking, but seeking the truth. I didn't have anybody to teach me at that time. So I was looking for it in the Word of God, which is probably the best place to go <laughs> instead of trying to let somebody else teach and take the easy way out. Okay, Matthew 3.11. John says, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he, talking about Jesus, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. All right, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 8. Again, at the very beginning, really, of the chapter. And again, it's John speaking. He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, talking about Jesus again. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, John. John chapter 1, verses 33. I did not know him, talking about Jesus, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, and to, and to upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, let me go back and read in that same, just stay right where you are. And I want to show you a couple, I want to show you three significant things about who Jesus is. Look at verse 29 of that same, we read 33, now go to 29. And then I'm going to read 33 and 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then 33, I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. 34. And I have seen and testified, been a witness, that this is the Son of God. Do you remember? Our word in, when Acts the, for 2016 was that, you know, you will be my witnesses of what you have seen and heard. Then in Isaiah 40, I can't even remember it. I think it's 43. Always, I took the easy way out, just kept it marked in my Bible. So Isaiah 43 says, you are my witness, says the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen. Uh, it goes on, uh, therefore you are my witness, says the Lord, that I am God. So right here, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Three significant things about Jesus that we can see right there in those three verses. 
Number one is that he is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. He is the sacrifice that paid the price in order for us to come back into right relationship with the Lord. Number two, it's Jesus that baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. And number three, Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. God baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. God is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. You know, an interesting thing, and I don't belittle this in any way because I know this is of greatest importance. But in those four Gospels, you know, it says in every one of them that Jesus is the one that baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Only there in John does it say that he is the lamb of God. Interesting. I wonder why. And, I, you know, the only thing I could think of is I think the enemy will fight you more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit than he probably will even will your salvation. I mean, he don't want you saved, I promise you. But he don't want you filled with the Holy Ghost, I promise you. You know, I thank God that we know God, that we know Jesus as our Savior and as the Lamb of God because apart from that, Man, there's no use. I mean, you couldn't be baptized because the one requirement of being baptized in the Holy Ghost is that you're saved. You have to be born again. Other than that, that's the only requirement. So I thank God that we know him as our Savior and as the Lamb of God, but I also thank God. And, and I'm, I'm growing in, my, in the revelation that Jesus, too, is my baptizer, the empowerer. Now I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to do a little bit of scripture. Acts chapter 1. We're going to read verses 4 and 5 right there. And this is, this is the, uh, you know, Jesus has been resurrected. And he gives the the disciples uh, some direction and so let's see what it's and being assembled together with them Jesus being with the disciples he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now so here Jesus is, is repeating the same thing that's been said all along. You know, it's the same thing that, that, okay, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to wait because I'm going to fulfill the promise that you've heard. You're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus again repeats the promise. And I believe, well, from what I can see, most, not every Bible scholar, but most Bible scholars agree and believe that uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, is the fulfillment of the scripture, that you will receive the promise. And I'm going to read that. Turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Doing Bible drill this morning. So Jesus has told them to go to Jerusalem to wait for the promise. Okay, then he, they've been waiting for 10 days in the upper room. It doesn't really, I, I don't think it says a whole lot what they were doing, but I, I imagine they were ministering unto the Lord. They were probably praying, fasting, seeking God, waiting on the promises, remembering what he had told them and standing on it and it says when the day of Pentecost had fully came they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting it filled it came from heaven and it filled it immersed the whole place it was like that waterfalls begin to come into that place from heaven into that place where they were at. Then there appear, appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them, each one of them. 
This wasn't just a corporate thing. It was an individual thing. Each one of them had an encounter with Almighty God. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Three things that we can see from that scripture right there is number one, it was a baptism. The Holy Spirit came from above and immersed them. It filled the entire place they were at. Number two, each of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sat upon each one of them. And it was, just, it was not just a corporate experience, but an individual experience. And number three, there was a supernatural overflow from the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And the overflow is they began to speak. It is a principle. Matthew 12, 34 says, this is a kingdom principle. God showed me this, and I thought, man, this is awesome. You know, and again, we can take it and apply it to different ways, but it, it, how it says is, is, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you are filled with, what you are full with, will automatically it's a principle it's a kingdom prince it will come out of your mouth if you are filled with the holy spirit it will come out of your mouth every place i've been able to find in the bible where it talks about people getting baptized filled with the holy ghost there's two one of two things that happened they either begin to prophesy the bible says or to speak in tongues <laughs> It came up, it was an overflow of what had just happened in them. If you want to know what somebody's about, listen to what they say. Listen to them talk. If, if everything that's coming out of my mouth is all worldly, then I'm full of the world. If it's all godly, talking about the things of God, that's what I'm filled with. Out of your mouth, out of what you are, uh, what is abundantly in you is what's going to come out of you. Listen, the overflow will always take place in speech. This is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. When they had been filled, they began to speak with other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them ultra. Or utterance. One of the things that I see in talking to people, and I can certainly relate to it because I had the same problem, is that in, to receive your prayer language, I didn't understand that I had to cooperate with God. Because, and it goes back to what Worth said, God, God is not going to make you do anything. He gives you a right. He gives you choice. He says, I've got a gift for you if you want it. I want you to have it. I would like for you to take it, but you don't have to. Really, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not going to stop you from being going to heaven. It's an empowerment to be a witness, to be a minister. But one of the things, you know, and I did it. Because I wanted to be so careful that it was that I wasn't doing something that you know that it wasn't me that it was God and I wanted God I kept praying day in day out day I was baptized in the Holy Ghost I know I was that very day I told you about at the conference but I wanted my prayer language but I wanted God to take over and just, just to come shooting out of my mouth w w to where I couldn't control it. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't, uh, I didn't know what to do. You know, it just, it just like boom. But I'm telling you, God don't do that. He will not do that. God filled me, but I had to begin to speak. The Holy Spirit don't do the speaking. You do the speaking, and the, uh, the Holy Spirit will give you the language the problem that I had and for most others that I talked to is that they're waiting on God to do it all. And you'll be waiting for the rest of your life if you wait on God to do it all. It's not scriptural and you will not get it 
if you don't do it. You receive salvation by faith. God don't make you. God don't just say, you're saved now. You have to say, I receive it by faith. You don't get your prayer language without receiving it by faith and doing it. God will do his part, but you've got to do your part. You do the speaking, God gives the language. The Bible says that they all began to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want to look at a couple other aspects of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, 22, if you want to turn there, because this is a good one. I love this. What I'm trying to do is set some, I don't know, some foundation, I guess, of this thing. And I want us to look at it from, from the different perspectives and what the Holy Spirit, why do we need it? How, do, how does it, what does it look like? What does it do? And, and help us to get it scripturally as best I can. God help us. First, or Second Corinthians one twenty two. The Bible says that God has sealed us, sealed us, put a seal on us is what that means, and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. He has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Paul says here that there are two things that the Holy Spirit does. He seals, he puts a seal on us. The Holy Spirit is a seal, and the Holy Spirit is a guarantee or a deposit. Paul again says in, the, in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Turn there real quick. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. So the Holy Spirit is a seal. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee. And in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it says in him, in Jesus, is who it's talking about, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, who, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Until the redemption of the purchased possession, the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is a seal. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we are sealed. We, it's like we've been stamped. When you are saved by believing and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord, you then become the property of of Jesus the seal of the Holy Spirit publicly identifies you as belonging to him the seal of the Holy Spirit publicly identifies you as belonging to him so what is the seal what publicly identifies you as belonging to Jesus It's the Holy Spirit, but I believe the evidence of that is the speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance. It's what people can see. It even says in the Bible, I didn't go back and find that, that, that uh, tongues is, you know, in, in, is, is for the unbelievers. It shows that, that you belong to him. It's a seal. So the question I often get asked too is how do I know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the overflow of tongues is from God and not from the devil because I was the same way I wanted to make sure I didn't want to do something and, and it be of the devil because I'd heard it preached a lot of times in my life that tongues was of the devil so I was scared I was cautious and I wanted to make sure it was from God so how do we know the answer is Jesus gave us the answer himself he said if you are a child of God, if you've been born again, saved, if you are a child of God and you ask your heavenly father for a piece of bread, he will not give you a snake. Hmm. So how do you know? 
if you are saved, if you are a child of God, and you ask God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he will not give you something that's not of him. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to the, those that ask him? So in other words, if you ask your heavenly Father for the right thing, he's going to give you the right thing. <laughs> However, if you're not a child of God, if you've not been born again, that principle does not apply to you. If you've not been born again, and, you know, I, re I remember, do you remember, I should have went back and got it in the Bible where, where this guy, he was a sorcerer and all this kind of stuff, did practice witchcraft and manipulation and all these kind of things. And he saw uh, one of the apostles, uh, you know, lay hands on the people and they began to speak in tongues. And, man, it was awesome. And, and, and he, he went up to him and said, look, I want that. How much would it, I'll pay you. What does it take for me to have that? See, he was, see, he was not... A son of God and 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 they they basically said man you're not with us. you get away from us because it's dangerous you start asking you're not born again and you start asking for power and signs and 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 words you'll you'll probably get them but it won't be from God the devil will be more than happy to give you a prayer language to him so if you are a child of God, you don't have to worry. The seal of the Holy Spirit is something visible, it's something audible, and something public. It cannot nor should it be kept hidden, and it is the proof of who you belong to. So let me give you three things concerning the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the disciples, when they went to the upper room, they waited 10 days to receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. But after receiving that seal, they never had to wait again. See, I mean, I've, how many times have you heard, if you'll just wait, just wait, just hold on, hold on, you know. But God's, God's offering you a gift, and you don't have to wait if you're born again. Second thing, the seal was the evidence that they belonged to God. Let me show you this in Acts 10, 43 through 46. And I'm going to paraphrase it because it's a little bit long to get kind of some of that all into perspective. So remember the story there in Acts that Peter was up on, uh, up on the roof there praying. It says, the Bible says that he went into a trance and he saw this this sheet coming down with all these animals and stuff that they wasn't supposed to have. The Jewish people wasn't supposed to have anything to do with. And, and the Lord spoke to him and said, there, Peter, eat. And he said, no, I, I can't eat that. That's unclean. And, and, and the Lord went on to explain to him and show him again and again that what he calls clean is clean. You know, so what God was about to do right there is begin to move this thing. The Jewish people believed at that time that they were the only one entitled, you know, to God. It was them and them alone. Everybody else was outside of the family of God. And God was in the process of beginning to open this up, thank God, to us, to the Gentiles. So he, he told, uh, he told Phil, or, or Peter that he wanted him to go to this place, this house, to this Gentile home. And in the meantime, he's talking to this Gentile uh, person over here, Cornelius, and saying, I want, you to, I want you to go get Peter and bring him to your home. So Peter sends some guys to him and says, come on, I want, we need you to come and come to our house and tell us about this Jesus. And so Peter goes, and, and before, prior to this, it would, have been, it would have been against the law. I mean, basically the religious law for Peter to even have gone into a home of a Gentile. But the Lord showed him that it was okay. So he took all these, uh, you know, his entourage with him, his Jewish believers, and here they went to Cornelius' house, and they began to tell him, being faithful to what God had told them, they began to tell him about Jesus and who this Jesus is. And the Bible says that, uh, let's see, let me see if I can read that part. It says, and the Bible says that when, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell come from heaven he immersed them from above and all of those that heard all the Jewish believers who were were with Peter heard them begin to speak in other tongues it was the seal they they knew right then that something had shifted because they saw something they thought was so limited to them 
And the cool thing about that is that these Jewish followers with Peter didn't ask for any other thing. They didn't question it then. When the minute they recognized that, that the Holy Spirit had came and baptized them, and as they began to speak in tongues, they said, well, you know, I don't understand it, but obviously God is going out to other people other than just us. And they didn't ask. They didn't say, well, you know what? We need some more proof of this. That seal was enough, seeing it. The third thing that I see, did I do? Yeah, I did too. The third thing was that concerning the seal of the Holy Spirit, that the disciples uh, of Jesus never asked for any other seal or evidence. That's where I was going. Many people ask the question, how do I know if I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? You will know when you receive the seal. When you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance, you have the seal. Today in many churches, we want to wait for fruit. We, wanna, we want, before we can believe or trust that you are a son or daughter of God, we want to see fruit. We wait for, you know, you got to go through all the classes. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to be here for such amount of time, you know, because we want to see the fruit but the fruit and the seal is two different things. The seal is what will really tell you who they belong to. Fruit happens through a process over a period of time, but the seal is instantly. Peter and the other Jewish disciples recognized the seal of the Holy Spirit on Cornelius' family, and they never asked God for another sign or needed any further evidence to know that they belonged to God. Not only is the baptism of the Holy Spirit sealed, but it's also the damn payment, that's what it says, or the deposit, or the guarantee that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back again to get what rightfully belongs to him. In Ephesians 1 and 13 and 14, which we already read, says, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase, possession to the praise of his glory. If you've ever done this, if you've ever done layaway, you know what I'm talking about. Or if you've ever made a deposit on something, you know what I'm talking about. You know, when you purchase something or make, an a, da make a down payment on something, it's a guarantee that you're going to take it. That Whatever that thing is, whether it be a deposit you make on a car or a house or layaway at Walmart, when you make that deposit, that thing becomes set apart for you because it belongs to you at that point as long as you finish the transaction and come back and get it and, and complete the transaction. We, the, the Holy Spirit, has made a down payment in, in us saying I'm coming back to get you I've gone to be with my father but I'm coming back and I will complete this transaction and you will forever be with me hallelujah we belong to him the baptism of the Holy Spirit is putting Jesus is Jesus putting a down payment on us and setting us apart for himself. After the baptism, after salvation, after the seal of the Holy Spirit, the down, uh, and that's the down payment's been made. You belong to Jesus. You're set apart. You're not for sale to anybody else. So he makes the down payment. You're set apart. You're not for sale. You totally, at that point, belong to him. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that he's coming back again. And I think that, that I want to stop right there for today, and then we're going to continue on next week because I just, I'm, I'm laying the foundation, and I want you to be able to uh, look at it scripturally. I want you to study. I want you to read. Look at, look at, what, uh, at all these places. I just think it's cool that, you know, that, that God will assure us and that he will prove over and over, you know, even throughout all the Bible, that 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 the Holy Spirit is real, that that the Holy Spirit is God. It's not a person. 
I mean, it's not a it, it's a person. He is a person. And he wants to dwell with us and be with us. So, I see Teresa's got a question. I see the look at her eye. Well, you know, when you said that the speaking in tongues, that it won't just overpower you and come out, which I understand and I, I agree with that. But I think that might be a stumbling block for some people because it felt like it come that way, but it's when the power comes upon you. I think we focused too much on getting the tongues part instead of understanding that the, th the real thing is when the power comes with it. That's the exactly yeah that's exactly right. that's good <laughs> i'll just say that, that that the tongues is just the evidence or the validation or verification of of what has happened the holy spirit's come upon you that's the power you know the, the tongues just just vi verifies that or, or 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 is evidenced to that but the the mistake that we make is to worship the evidence uh, yeah, yeah. We we make more about the evidence than we do the actual power. It the, the proof is you've been or the 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 thing to be celebrated is not the fact that you can sp you're speaking in a tongue, that is that you have now been, uh, you have come and joined together, been immersed in the power of God, now to do things. For, first of all, you've been sealed now at this point, and now that's your guarantee. And because now that guarantee is like a warranty, it, but it's a lifetime warranty. He, he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and uh, I'm, I've got to go away, but I'm going to send you a comforter. And that comforter is going to come. That comforter did come on the day of Pentecost. It was evidenced by the speaking in tongues. But like what Teresa said, it's the power. We've been endued with power. So we shouldn't uh, exalt the evidence over the power. And that's that's the important part. Yeah, that's a good point. These are things. It's hard. I'll be honest. This is a hard subject to teach because it, there's so many components in it, kinda, you know, and and things that you have to be careful of because of our the way we've been trained and heard and taught. Well, no two people receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit the same way. And yeah. there, there again, it's that individual thing. It came upon them individually. Some people, you know, just, I've seen people go wild. I've seen people just do nothing, basically. So, I mean, it's individual. Uh, and the thing of, the, the thing that, you know, I'm trying to help us understand is in that prayer language. And it's not that, okay, now I've got tongues. That's not the deal. The deal is that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that, that but the vi there is value in the tongues it's that i can begin to pray when i don't know what to pray i can pray the perfect will of god when i don't even know what i'm saying that that i can when i don't know what to do i can go to a place in him and pray that i don't know what to pray for it builds me the bible says it edifies you it strengthens you it builds you up and people have said it's kind of like a hook, hook into jumper cables you know you're charged is what that word means it's you're charged up it's a that's a power that comes upon you uh through through that but i you know here's the thing and this is what i keep hearing from the lord we only know in part the main thing is that we remain teachable, that we remain open to what God wants to do and teach. But that's why I want to take it real, real slow. I just don't want to do a little service and say, okay, now we're all going to get filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized, speaking in tongues, and you know, because I want us to get it. And, and then when you're ready, you'll be ready. The Lord, I'll tell you my testimony again a little bit more. For weeks after that experience, I would ask the Lord, I'd say, God, I want my prayer language now. I knew I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. I knew I was. From what I'd read, what I'd studied, I knew it because I'd had this encounter. My life was changed right then. Um, I was on a different direction than I'd ever been. 
And uh, I kept praying, God, I want my prayer language. It says in your word. I'd quote the word. I'd, I'd studied it. I'd researched it. I could quote it. I could go through there. And, 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 and I'd say, God, I want it. And it was like one day. This had gone on for weeks. I was standing out on the patio, and I was praying and asking God to give me a prayer language. And I guess he got sick of me asking because it's like one of those things that, that, at least the way I heard it, he said, you have got it, now do it. That's exactly what I heard from the Lord. It's like, it's like he's almost frustrated with me. But I know he wasn't, but, but he said, do it. So I just began to open my mouth and to do it. And I was like, well, God, no, this is just me. And he said, just, just you do it. You have it, do it. So it will be you speaking. And the devil will say, well, I didn't realize that's just you doing it. It is just you, you doing it. But by faith, you will begin to open your mouth, and he begins to start, let something go within you. And it's like somebody else was saying, I only had, you know, a baby learns to talk. They don't, a baby don't just one day jump up and have a full vocabulary. We're still learning to talk. We're still learning new words. Some people I've seen get filled with the Holy Ghost, and man, they their prayer language is like boom. There it is. For me, I have one word, and I was all I had, and I felt like an idiot. I just said that one word, and I didn't know what else to do, and he just said, just keep saying it. And I just said that word for days. And then it's like uh, gradually there's another kind of something else would come to it, and I'd add that to it. And then a little more, and then a little more. And just over the years, it's kind of developed, you know. And I think part of that problem is because I was older and my mind and having to, you know, not being willing to just step into it and do it. So don't be afraid if you just got one word. Pray one word. And see, a lot of times, too, you think it's this, this overwhelming thing that, my gosh, it's gonna, you're just going to go out on the floor you, 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 you might just because of the encounter of God, but I can pray in tongues anytime I want to. I can now, and I can stop anytime I want to. I can ride up a road praying in tongues. Most of the time, I'm praying in tongues. <laughs> People, I bet, think I'm crazy. If they see me, they probably think, who in the world is he talking to? Because <laughs> I just pray in tongues, and, and I can stop it anytime I want to. It's not like you get this, you're overcome by God, and you can't do anything. You, you do it. You do it. Who else? I saw somebody else. When the word says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, because we're these humans and we have these minds and we tend to live up here rather than in the spirit, I think we get a skewed visual of what that looks like. But the power of the Holy Spirit gives us individually the ability to overcome sin in our own lives. And that is the witness to the world. Well, let me just testify of that right there, too. There was stuff that I had struggled in in my life until I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, and, and it's like that power come. It was a supernatural ability to, to deal with stuff that I couldn't deal with before. I'd try and I couldn't. And Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share in the fellowship of his sufferings. And we know, all know about that. That isn't fun. But anyway, <laughs> you're sharing with what Jesus went through. But um, the power of his resurrection, it's like, it's amazing. I mean, one, I, mean I, I always think of it like the darkness that Jesus had to go through before. And I mean, we all have days of darkness. And then... I mean, the Lord comes in and resurrects us in our spirit, and we're and and you wonder how did I ever get in that darkness? But I mean, He just shows Himself strong, and it's resurrection power that to me that is a witness. There is nothing greater to me than to pray for someone that is so down and so uh, you know despaired and so. Uh, you know, and then see God come in and change them and give them a hope in him. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's got to be in him, a new hope in him. 
And so that, to me, is real resurrection power that we experience um, that Jesus, that Jesus, he was resurrected, and but we're resurrected too. And it's just amazing that God would say that through Paul, and then we would experience it. And to me, that's, that is a real witness. This is what I live with. <laughs> I'm blessed. <laughs> Uh, he gives us a real hope and a real future, and it's unique to us it, because we're all individually different. There's no, and, and we get in trouble when we compare ourselves with each other, and he says if we're going to get in the, that aspect of comparing, then it, at least compare ourselves with the Christ, that, the son that he gave us. That's, that's the, the lodestone that we need to look up to and try to become light. And, and trust me, uh, we're all going to represent that lightness in, in the uniquely different ways that he's created each one of us. So that helps a lot. I wanted to, at a time in my life, I didn't know much, except I, I came across, I uh, found Benny Hinn. And for some reason, Benny Hinn uh, uh, kind of was someone that I wanted to know a little bit about, I guess. And I found this book that he wrote uh, called Good Morning Holy Spirit. And and that that helped me a lot uh, to understand how, you know, I'm, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And basically, uh, the reality is, as far as I understand it right now, if it w you know, without being spiritual, the Father and the Son are in, in heaven. And it's the Holy Spirit that we engage with here on this earth. And, and that's w and he's a gentle person. And Benny Hinn is a person, if you, if you read this little book, it's real easy to read. That's the reason I read. I, well, I'll just say one other thing. I have a lot of fun letting people know that I'm like Charlie Brown <laughs> laying on that mound with Lucy and Linus. And Linus is looking at all the Beethoven sonatas and symphonies. I can't even say the words that he sees in the clouds. <laughs> and Lucy's seeing all kinds of other things. They turn to Charlie and ask him what he sees. And he says, well, I see a rubber ducky and a little whatever else. <laughs> and, and that's kind of the way I feel like I am in this whole spiritual environment. But, but God can use that. God, God will walk into wherever we are however sophisticated we may be. And if we are, praise God. And if we understand what that world is, then run with it. But if you're in another world, which I feel like I have been, but he's shown me amazing things in a very easily discernible way. And Benny Hinn in this book, Good Morning Holy Spirit, helped me not be afraid of the Holy Spirit, but to realize how that I'm living in the midst of the Holy Spirit. That's God's contact with me. Uh, really on this earth and not to be afraid and, and, and not to worry so much about am I quote speaking in tongues or what is all that really about I've I mean I this is all this happens but it's uniquely different to each one of us and we trust me if we're in the right area that God wants us to be something inside us will be responding to his who he is I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, we all have different different triggers that let us know, well, God, you're there. And thank you for, for caring about me in this particular place. But don't waste all your time on me. There's a world out there that needs it. <laughs> so uh, another way, I'm just saying, I used to, what Pastor Mike is talking about, that, that, that whole idea of do you have the Holy Spirit? Have you found him? Maybe are you walking in and all that kind of that was a real that was almost a trap and a that was a law. I mean it it really and once you just relax and receive the way God communicates with you and you know how he communicates with you because you're you and he knows how you are. And he and he he responds. He responds back to you in ways that it's very difficult to tell somebody else how he responded to you. But you know it confirms in your heart that he's real, and that's what keeps you willing to keep on, keep it on. And and he never, he he, he never disappoints. 
He always comes when you really need him. And he le leaves you a better in a better place when he and you when you think about it, I don't know how in the world anybody, let alone the Holy Spirit, even can minister to the billions of people that potentially might call out and ask for his help on this earth. It's just it's mind boggling. <laughs> and but what what you bring from your house into this house empowers everybody here. It, you know, like it said, it gives somebody else encouragement or the permission to go where you're at. And and what a, a terrible thing to have to say that what you're doing in private is so strong, you need to bring it here with us. Most of the time, it's the opposite. I've, I've heard people say that, you know, don't pretend here what you're not doing at home. But a lot of you, from what you're saying and the way you're acting in, in the I don't know, the mannerisms, you're you're doing things at home. Maybe even we don't even know. You may even have it, lady, and don't even know it, you know? I mean, because, and we're learning. And what you have at home, Jeremy, you've probably got something at home. See, you're nodding, baby. Bring it here because that Holy Spirit here will encourage David or me or worth into, oh, what, what is that? Well, that's, let me dig into that. That fuels this fire. And when all this burns hot on Sunday morning, it inflames everything else to go the rest of the week. So it just it goes from Sunday to week to week to Sunday from our private time to in here. So if we want to see this place engulf and go higher, bring that here with you on Sunday mornings. I don't really know how to put this in words, but the Lord has been speaking to me all week about not quenching the fire like you say you know when we share and actually speak what the Lord is teaching us it encourages others and lights that fire he really spoke to me on about quenching not quenching the spirit and in God's word the spirit is related to fire and quenching means putting out so that's literally what many of us are doing I found something before you started speaking. I just wanted to read it. It's short. The Lord has spoke it to me, I guess, about two months before we moved here. Because I caught myself, I'm always behind closed doors. <laughs> the Spirit takes over, and I don't even recognize myself. My kids have walked in seeing me pray and it's like I freeze like someone caught me I think a lot of us are quenching the spirit and that's why we're not able to grow that's what the enemy has used to bind us to keep us from growing so I just want to read this real quick because it is short but it goes along with it you, you will never be able to completely see when you allow yourself to hide behind those walls, whenever others can see you, stop hiding, step out, stand tall in my name. Cowards hide and you are no coward, but you allow the enemy to step in and make you think you must hide to praise me when you see others near. Stop fearing. Didn't I say stop quenching my name? For the blind don't even hide. They show up and show out to all evil. So you too must show up and show out in my name. Stop allowing fear to control you. The enemy is trying to bound you by fear so you can't grow in my name. So as I've said, stand up, step out, and shout my name from the highest mountaintop. That way my name echoes for all to hear. That is a struggle of mine. But if it's a struggle of mine, I know it's a struggle of many others, too. I promise you that's probably the biggest struggle amongst us all. Why? I don't know. We'll be bold in anything of the world, but then ashamed of the gospel. Why? How is that? So I just want to say, I, when, when I first came to this, I very much struggled uh, with speaking in tongues and with uh, praying in the Holy Spirit uh, and we're coming in it really comes from a lifetime for me 
of even great men of God telling me uh, how this was no longer of God um, and talking about how you had to have interpreters and all these kind of things had to be in place and all that and even someone who had uh, had the sp had had the spirit come on me and had you know been able to speak and do things that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise um, and one of the conversations I had with Steve Smith that really brought me through it is when he talked about understanding of God gave man a gift of free will. He gave man a will, and by his nature, he can't violate that. So there will never be a time that comes that something comes upon you you don't control or you don't speak or coming in. Even when given a gift or empowerment, you still have to turn your will, your desire. If you're given a language, you still have to speak it. And just like sin and other things build up barriers in your life and false teachings build up those barriers in your life, you have to move those out of the way in order to allow what's been given you to flow, to come out. That's why it can start at just that one word. If you can just get that one word open, it's like a dam. You've, you've moved the first brick and the water's coming out. Let it flow. And... That's where it's, I think, speaking tongues is evidence of things. It's not whether you've been empowered or whether you've been given. It may be a question of whether you've turned your will and desire to speaking. and Or if you're looking for some, you know, God's going to do this for me uh, and something's just going to come across me and all these words are going to start flowing out, you will know everything that sits in your spirit and you will speak it. That's kind of the nature of how God gives everything to us and his plan and purpose is that what he gives to us, we need to give back. We need to let out. We need to speak. And that was something that was very important for me to understand. And, I, you know, I still struggle with some of those men and women who were my mentors and fathers growing up and others um, who I know God is in their life uh, and speaks to them and others, but they don't uh, manifest in that uh, version but it's just knowing that we've all got something in the way and it really becomes that choice or will or others. Are we going to speak and are we going to let it out? The thing I, you know, the thing I come to the conclusion of, you know, is if God's got it for me, then it's surely a purpose. And if he's got, if he wants me to have it, then I want to have it. I love this. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, Man, this is so good, and it's so good that we can do it this way. I love this. One of the things I, God just reminded me, sitting right back there, I used, to, I used to laugh about it, and I did it. It was a worldly thing, but God showed me, said, that's something I put in you, and you need to continue to foster that, is I was always good at getting something going. I could get two people in a fight and then just back out. <laughs> Or I could get a discussion going and then just get out of the way <laughs> and let it go. And God said, that's all you need to do. You need to get it up and going and get out of the way. <laughs> I probably needed to spend less time up there, more time like this. Just get it going, get it stirring. So that's what we're going to be talking about again next week, so be prepared. And let's go. But isn't, isn't this awesome just to hear and to grow and to learn from one another and and listen, we're in this thing together. Again, not, and let me say this before I, I might forget to say it at some point. Salvation is the key. Okay? You're not any more saved by if you've got a prayer language than if you are if you don't. You're not any more spiritual or any more important to God. or You're not less than or somebody else is not more than. We're all together. It's a gift of God that's available, and man, but I believe for this house, the reason I felt strongly that we go here is that I think it's the time that we're in for this house. You know, Ralph, I don't know, and I know it's too late, and if anybody needs to go, just you can begin to ease out, but, but Ralph, do you, I mean, I know that there was an instance even in North Carolina, you know, where they're trying to, anything you want to share on that, or thank God for Ralph, so I well, you know, 
I'll just say, and I know it, it's come up again, and we've seen in New York and Virginia and others, you know, just this concept of how um, life has been thrown out and doesn't have value. And, I mean, we even had a governor of Virginia saying, well, we should just keep the baby uncomfortable uh, while its mother and doctor decides uh, whether they're going to let it die or kill it. Uh, that's coming in after it's born. Uh, and we've got the same thing coming here in North Carolina. We had somebody in the House actually from Asheville file last week a bill uh, to legalize abortions up through birth uh, in North Carolina and to extend it to any attempted abortions or others after birth. Uh, that's who coming in. And, you know, it, and I just want to say it, it's not the bill. It's not the process. That bill's not going anywhere. I'm not... You know, I'm, I'm not concerned about that, although it wouldn't take a whole lot of swing uh, to where we'd be in a different situation. But for now, I'm not worried about it. But there's never going to be, uh, the thing I'm focused on, there's never going to be a government or legislative answer to the problem of people's hearts and how they respect life and how they respect individuals. It's not about what can the government do to fix a problem or even about what bill is a government putting in place when you look at New York there's a real problem that we continue to see and we all know is that this is the condition of people's hearts this is what is taken over this is what they now express as love for an individual is allowing them to choose to end a life and it's not going to be something that changes in our policies or in our legislation that fixes that problem. It's really going to take a movement of the spirit that will open people's eyes to respect life and to understand the gifts as God had given them, not just life, but all the gifts that God has given us coming forward and what his plan and purpose is and how we fit it into that role and whether we elevate ourselves to the level of God or we understand who he is. And that's just, you know, in the prayer and in the focus, uh, I know with myself I got so mad when I saw the new World Trade Center or whatever it's called now. They, they lit up pink to celebrate this and I've heard other things. But it's not the anger that we need. Uh, it really is an outpouring and a speaking of the Holy Spirit uh, that we need. Yes, we can work on a bill that may limit it or do some changes, but when it really comes down to it, if we aren't going to change the hearts and minds of people uh, to love and to understand those gifts, uh, then nothing we do will be successful. Dear Heavenly Father God, we come before you today, first and foremost, giving you thanks, God. Giving you thanks for what you have poured out on your people, what you have poured out on this community, and God, what you have poured out upon this house. God, we thank you for the ability just to come together with a family of believers, God, and hear from you and speak to you and worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we get ready to walk out this door today, and we know the world that we're facing. Uh, we know a world where the enemy has control and, you know, he has his will. But we thank you that you've given something in each and every one of us. You've given us a word. We've talked about languages and prayers, but God, you've put a word in each one of us to go outside these walls and to speak to the mountains, to speak, God, to the world, to speak to the leaders and the rulers in high places and darkness of this world, God, and to tell them to be cast down and to tell them to move out of the way, God. Give us each the strength and understanding, God, to go out and speak that word that you have put inside of us. God, we bless you. We lift you up, God. God, we want to say in all that we do, let it be for your glory and for your purpose. And these things we offer, God, in the only authority you've given us under heaven, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ.